I encourage you to take your New Testaments and turn with me to the book of Titus. While it is between, you know, first and second Timothy, we should, we should as chronological order, we would have Titus uh, between first Timothy and second Timothy. So in our minds, we have to place it there when we think about the background. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning uh, and get into, I don't know if we'll be able to get into lesson one or not, but we'll be ready to do that uh, if, today if we, if we need to. But I wanted to, to lay out the, the time frame, the place uh, that we know that, that Titus was upon. And notice in, in Titus 1 and verse 5, where is, uh, where is, where has Paul been? And he's been there with Titus. And we know that, for he says, for this cause left I thee in Crete. I left you in Crete. And therefore he was, he was there. We've seen him in 2 Timothy, knowing that he would not be out of prison. Acts, the book of Acts has him going to prison. And apparently he was released from Rome, came to treat Crete. And he is somewhere in Nicopolis or further north into Macedonia. Some say he's over at Ephesus when he writes this epistle. But from those locations, he will be arrested within the year, taken to Rome, put to death, some say about 68 AD, just a few months before Nero died. And Nero had him put to death with a sword before he departed this, this life. So we see things happening rapidly from 62, from his first imprisonment, 62 AD, and now he's released. So we're looking at a time frame here of 65 to 66 AD. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit. I want us to, to see Crete. We see that on the uh, map in the Mediterranean Sea. Is it a peninsula or is it an island? The Isle of Crete. It's surrounded by water, is it not? And what we see is, is the fact that it is kind of wide, or we might say that's long and wide. Well, how do you want to look at that? But if I'm saying 156 miles long, but only 7 to 30 miles wide, how am I looking at it? I look at this east to west. That's how long, that's how long it is. That's, my fish go like that. You know. and, uh, but we say, well, how tall are you? How long? And the broad, the, you can see where parts of that island would be about seven miles, but to, to 30 miles in distance. So it's a relatively small place. At that time, 150 miles was, uh, was a good, uh, good walk and travel. But uh, it has become uh, an important place for the church to grow. And it would be in a place where you think that, uh, I don't know if we're going to do a good work here or not, Brother Paul. But he left Titus there, and we'll, we'll get into some things ab about that as well. So that's kind of the, the place it is. It's a real place. It's not, it's not just made up. And it's a real place. Paul was there. Uh, Titus was, was left there. And so we begin to ask ourselves, well, what's interesting about this place? It is interesting that most commentators, maybe they're trying to make a point. They make the point that it was not inhabited by many wild beasts. You talk about beasts, lions and tigers or that sort of thing, or bears. It, it was an island that didn't have a lot of that. And yet Paul will describe them as these people describe themselves as, as being evil beast. There are, they are lazy stomachs and, and they're, they're gluttons, but they're lazy and they, they feed their flesh as we see in, in Titus 2 and, and verse, uh, Titus, Titus 2 and verse 12, instructing us to attend dying and God's world, unless we shall live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. That's going to be the emphasis that is, is upon them. But Titus 1 and verse 12, one of themselves a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always what? Liars. That's just, that's just what you can expect from these people. Uh, they're liars. It's consistent with them. Evil beast. 
and idle gluttons. How can you be an idle glutton? Seems like you're feeding your face pretty well. You're lazy and you're a glutton. And some of those, that's going to work against itself unless you go to a lot of uh, parties or something. Have someone else cook it. You're too lazy to make it yourself. But they're lazy, feeling the lust of their flesh. They, he describes them as evil beasts, maybe not having any kindness or any consideration or even thinking about the well-being of another. It's just dog eat dog, bear eat bear, lion eat bear, lion. Uh, it's the laws of the jungle. Evil beast. And you could not depend upon them to tell the truth. That's a good place for the gospel to grow in it. Yeah, it is. Because the gospel is needed. That's the way we got to think. How? That's not going to be a profitable work. You know, that's, that's going to have... The demographics are not just good. But what do we have there? And Paul was interested in that. Titus was interested in that. And so we find the, the gospel be, beginning there. And appointing elders will be there. That's, that's important for why Titus has left. And so it's kind of just interesting. It kind of goes against the way we think about things. That, but as he told Timothy, do the work of evangelists, suffer the hardship. Fulfill your ministry that the gospel needs to be heard by people who are in sin. And these people have a problem, don't they? Their problem is sin. The character that has been just prevalent has got to change. Well, they've always liars. That's just the way, the way it is. Well, that needs to change. And what does that is the, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. So we see that Paul left him there. Paul will be in prison pretty, pretty soon. But let's talk about Titus for just a moment. What does verse 4 say about Titus? He is my true child after a common faith, is what my translation says. He, he says he's, he's my true child. Did he have a wife? Did he have children? That they weren't born out of wedlock, he's my true child. Is that what he's telling us? No, we've already seen with Timothy where Paul beget him through the gospel. He's talking about his spiritual birth. And he had a part of that. You have many fathers, but you only you have one father that begets you through the gospel. And that's where that's where Paul was he was filling that that place. And so there's that spiritual connection with with Timothy and that's what he emphasizes it's not that that he is a, a child that I didn't know I had he's my true child after a common faith you don't know the difference between holy and that which is common is it less than what it ought to be I see the word and while our word says common we kind of think that's that's just common that's just common that's nothing exceptional now, what he means by that is something we share, community, fellowship. The idea we share together the same gospel. That gospel that which beget him to become a Christian and now a worker with me on this island of Crete. Paul is telling the world, he, no, that's how he's writing his letter. He wants Titus to understand that you are my true child. And we share a faith. I'm an apostle, you're not. You're a fellow worker. But we share a common faith. I don't care for elders, deacons. We're young, we're old, we're members of, of the church, or we're fulfilling some work for the church. That sort of thing. We all have a common faith of sharing together the same faith. How many faiths are there? One faith, one Lord. There's one baptism. We didn't get different baptisms to get in here. And we look in the book of Acts. When people were baptized in the baptism of John, they were then baptized in the baptism of the Lord. Well, I've already been baptized. Why were you baptized? Into what were you baptized? What's your motive of being baptized? That becomes very important. And there's only one baptism that brings us into Christ, and that's the baptism in the name of the Lord. And share all of that. And it is a common faith, not looking down upon it. It's something we share together. It is the concept, the spiritual concept 
of the getting through the gospel, the spiritual concept of community, that's which we're sharing, we have in common. And that is a beautiful way to let Titus know my relationship with you and your relationship with me. And he describes him as a, as a fellow worker. So when we see Titus in the scriptures, he was with Paul as he went up to Jerusalem. I think this event is back in Acts the 15th chapter. And what was happening in Acts 15? When you open your Bibles to Acts 15 and verse 1, what were some people teaching there? What were they teaching? That's right. You've got to be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be saved. Now that's going to be fighting words with Paul because we're only saved through the gospel, not the works of law. And the New Testament doesn't say we're to be circumcised in our flesh. We're to circumcise our hearts. We're to put away the evil from our hearts. But that circumcision of the flesh is what Jews who were Christians were now teaching. And all the Gentiles that are going to come into the church, uh, well, we have a common faith, but we've got to be circumcised. Well, I wasn't circumcised. Who could say that? I wasn't circumcised. Could Timothy say that? No. Titus could say that. Because what do we see in Galatians, the second chapter, verses 2 and 3? And because of the Jews, Timothy would be circumcised. But that's not contradicting here. It's a fact that here because there were a lot of Jews there. And they knew he was a, a Greek. They didn't want to, the Jews to, the idea that somehow we're better than you. Gentiles are better than you and that sort of thing. He had him circumcised so they wouldn't be a stumbling block to them. But when you started placing it in the point about this is the, this is the foundation for your salvation. This is how you respond to Christ, to the gospel. What do we see here? Galatians 2, verse 1. After the space of 14 years. So Paul is converted at, at, in, in, uh, in A.D. 36. 14 years, A.D. 50, that would fit right in with Acts, the 15th chapter. Because in Acts 12, we know from history that around 44 A.D., Herod died suddenly of some cause. And we know what the, the cause he's eaten with worms and God killed him. But that was about there. So I go from Acts 12 to Acts 50, six years. That kind of fits okay. And that's what we're, we're looking at here. But this was that event that they were dealing with, that, that doctrine. So he says, I'm, he took Titus. Titus was also with me. And I went up to by revelation, God sending him up there, I laid before them the gospel which I preached unto the Gentiles, but privately before them, who, are, who were of repute, lest by any means I should be running or had run in vain. Some commentators say, well, I'd be running in vain. I, I, I need to know if I got the right doctrine. Elders, would you talk to me about that? Was he worried about the teaching? No. He just won't know if he'd run in vain. What are the elders teaching now? Because in Acts 15, guys were coming up and saying, the elders send us, and you're going to have to be circumcised. And that's the problem. They were disgusted at Acts. They had then to have, to have that discussion because there were some coming from Jerusalem, and they were involved in saying that, you know, the authority from the elders, that we've been sent them. But that wasn't true. It wasn't true. You know, people tell lies. Cretans ought to know that, but that just happens elsewhere too. And he says, it means I was running in vain. Not that I need to get my teaching right and, and I hadn't got it straight yet and I maybe missed out. I'll talk to the elders. Galatians, he's trying to tell you, I, don't, I didn't have anything to do with the elders before this event. And I went up privately to make sure, are they on board or have they turned? Because I know what the truth is. He was infallibly guided by, guided by God. And he just wanted to know if I run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Timothy's mother was a Jewish. His father was a Greek. But he was, Titus was a Greek. And 
Why did he do that? Because they just want to be rebellious and contradictory and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> one day he does, one day he doesn't. Eh, Titus is with me. We're not going to do it today. No, the motives are pure for the gospel. And he said, we, did, we didn't do it because of false brethren, privily brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ. Paul's not having a problem with his doctrine, with his belief. We have a liberty in Christ. You can be circumcised or not. We're not going to put it in the necessities of the gospel for salvation. And that's the, that was the issue. And that they might bring us unto bondage, because we'd be under a system that could never save us from sin, of whom we gave place in the way of subjection, given in to them. Well, you did it with Timothy, not doing it now. Timothy was a situation where where would they go? The Jews could not sit there initially and... and Look at that as being a problem. He, he was circumcised. Let's move on to the next city. But here was the issue that had come. No, not for our, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Not start with you. Not, well, we're going to revise it a little bit, sort of get along. That truth will continue with you. And so Titus was in the middle of that. He was the, he was the poster boy of uh, this, this issue where Paul stood up. He stood fast when everybody was compromising. Everybody, a lot of people were compromising and they had been troubled. The brethren were troubled and, and, and uh, disturbed about that. They had, it had to be settled. And so Titus went with them and he did not, he was not compelled, not forced to be circumcised. And there again, when you stand up sometimes, that's all you need to do. It's just somebody needs to stand up and, re and, and deal with the, the false claims, false teaching. Uh, there's a point that you're not going to compromise, and this was the point. Because they were bringing in works of the law for justification before God. And Galatians, Romans is like that, but Galatians is that they do not... They, they, they are not connected at all. They're, they're, they're totally separated in the book of Galatians. He's just trying to, one aspect from it, you're under bondage. Why are you under bondage? Because when you sin, bulls and goats can't take away that sin. Well, we got Jesus. <laughs> no, but you've added to justification by faith. It's not justification by faith and circumcision. By faith. And we'll see baptism is connected with that faith. And that, you know, the turning from their... The world of sin was part of that faith, but not circumcision. So we're interested in him as he's completed his uh, first journey, going into that, that second journey. Apparently Titus's presence, maybe it's cause of the mission he was on, or some specific things he was going together for Paul that made him special on this occasion when he wrote 2 Corinthians. But his presence was important to Paul on his missionary journeys. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, and, and verse 13, when we see how Paul felt. I had no relief for my spirit, because I found not Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went forth into Macedonia. Verse 12 says that when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and a door was opened to me in, into the Lord. You know, he, he was being successful. Opportunities were there, but I had, I had no relief from my spirit. Titus, he wanted Titus there to see how others, how his work was going with, at other places, not at Crete at the time, but with other uh, places that uh, he, he was being a fellow worker with Paul. Well, Paul was in one place, he was in another. Well, we, we pick up, uh, go to chapter 7. We might add a little bit more understanding of why he wanted him there. He's writing to the Corinthians. Nevertheless, verse 6, he that comforteth the lowly. He says, even God comforteth us by the coming of Titus. He's here. I've been wanting him here. But he comforts the humble, the lowly. He said, but he comforteth us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but also by the comfort wherewith he was comforted in you 
which he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice yet more. Titus, tell me how the Corinthians are reacting to my teaching, apostles' teaching. Tell me that first letter, <laughs> a lot of division in Corinth. How do they do it? When you want to know important information that's very important when you when you read first corinthians there's one problem right after another will they do this they're going to keep suing one another uh you know are they going to keep devouring one another all, all this and uh promoting one one miraculous gift over another uh to promote themselves he's got all sorts of issues and they are spiritually spiritual heart issues attitudes have to be changed Conduct has to be changed. And he, he didn't know how to accept it. They didn't have Zoom. Hey, I can see this. I can see his face. Hey, why is he cutting off right now? He must not like what I said. They didn't have any of that response. You couldn't look at their faces to see the response that they had with, with the teaching. Titus, find out for me. And he came. He talks about how they had received that. First, uh, received him and so forth. And it, he rejoiced. Verse 13 says, therefore, we have been comforted. And in our comfort, we joyed the more exceedingly for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. My true child after a faith, I care about Titus. I I'm, I'm appreciate the fact that how you re had received my letter and received my teaching. But how you treated Titus is, is, is commendable. If that you, you may cause him to rejoice to, as well. For if anything I have glory to him on your behalf, I was not put to shame. I think they'll accept you, Titus. I believe they're that type of people that will. And he, his glory was not put to shame. But as we spake all things to you in truth, so our glory also which I made before Titus was found to be true. That's a good day. That's a good day. When you finally get the word in, they didn't have, you know, quick communication. It's just Titus, go there. Titus, you get back here. And he wasn't there. He wasn't there in Troas. And uh, he, he had to, to move on. And his heart was heavy. But there is someone there that says, I can depend upon you. And we'll see how much so. But. You know, I, I thought about our, our modern times and, and uh, different churches been involved with, but primarily this one. A lot of times elders, they can't be everywhere where we send the money for the gospel. Well, they can't be there uh, at, at every place. Sometimes there are new preachers that are worthy of help. Elders haven't met them before. It's word of mouth about uh, from faithful men that you have that have been there. There may be an issue that comes up that could be fraudulently administered. There may be just somebody just wanting money. And I, I don't know about that man. I heard from him quite a while. He's preaching the gospel. We send him money and different parts of the world. Our, our dollar still buys a lot. And so they may have important thing. I, I'd like to know how things really are there. And a lot of times you've depended on men that have preached there that are from the states that are familiar with the work there. They may know others that know that man. And a lot of times the truth can be found out that way without them being there. And yet that takes time. It takes effort, it takes resources, it takes time, and we could probably sit over there and, and we write it back and, and kind of ease the mind of the elders. But that happens even today, which is rightfully so. Local churches have oversight how their money is used, and they want to make sure uh, it's always used correctly. So sometimes foreign works, distance problem, we still have that today and are able to communicate. And it's the same thing when you hear, oh, what was been said is good. Everything's good. We're, we're, we're okay. That's a relief. And there's great joy when they're excited about what you're 
you're presenting to them or what they've learned, what, the preaching that's been accepted. And so that's how he's important. He'd been sent on a mission, but it was important that, that Paul hears from him. But what goes with that was his trust in Titus. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 6. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, what's the issue? What, what, what is the, what's happening there that's part of the work of the church? And started back in 1 Corinthians 16. They're taking up a collection from Corinthians and the Macedonians, other places, putting that money together and being sent to uh, these local churches are having messengers that represent them. And they're sending them, that, putting that money together and taking it to Jerusalem. And the book of Acts is full of, of uh, you know, Paul getting things ready in his journey. And that's why he goes to Jerusalem. And he's, he's hoping that it'll be received by the people there. So 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul had talked about in 1 Corinthians, they needed to finish the work. <laughs> they needed to get it done. And they were dragging their feet in Corinth. So Titus was sent. And so in verse 6, insomuch that we exhorted Titus, that he had made a beginning before, so he would also complete in you, get the job done, this grace also. Now, sometimes we talk about the grace of God as being unmerited favor. We're saved by grace through faith, and the grace of God is, is true. Sometimes the word grace is going to be dealing with miraculous gifts. Grace was on him. It's in a context you'll determine that that, well, that was the showering of gifts by his favor upon him. So it has a miraculous context, not only a saving context, but sometimes it can be giving. This grace, this ministration of the saints, this is the grace he's talking about in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. We thank him for his great gift. And yeah, I thank him for Christ. That's true. But the context is that we're thankful that a bunch of us Gentiles in these churches and Macedonia and Achaia and you, know, you got Corinth, that uh, they were giving to help the Jewish saints in Jerusalem. That was a big deal of the change of hearts of people that indeed we have a common faith we are brothers and sisters. We're not, only, we're not Jew and Gentile. We're one man in Christ. And so Titus, is, he's, he's all on board. He's in one accord with doing this, but it was to be completed. And Paul wrote them the first letter, I want you on the first day of the week to lay by and store so no collections be made when I come. That I got to come to everybody individually and get that? No, put it in a common treasury. And Titus was involved in making sure it's finished, that work is finished. Paul's writing these letters to encourage that. And so he was, he was on that mission uh, of completing that work. Now, drop down there with verses 16 and 18. But thanks be to God who putteth the same earnest care for you in the heart of Titus. For he accepted indeed our exhortation. But being himself very earnest, he went forth unto you on his own accord. And we have sent together with him the brother whose praise in the gospel is spread through all the churches. And not only so, but who was also appointed by the churches to travel with us in the matter of this grace, which is ministered by me to the glory of the Lord and to show our readiness. All through here, he's, he's been talking about the grace that's been collected this ministration it's this particular activity that express God's grace because we're one man in Christ it very it's kind of uh, context will limit it that to what he want, what what the Holy Spirit is wanting you to understand it's not what you you're going to go out here and I just grace is one thing all the time it, it has all sorts of facets in it and this is one of them that they're helping needy saints when i'm a gentile and they're a jew and the jews are receiving it that's what paul hoped they will and that's what what, what is happening and so we'll notice that in verse 23 because paul can say these men now do you know who that other man was 
Titus was there. Who else was with him? That had been appointed by the churches, who has a great reputation among all the churches. Who might that be? He doesn't name him. But you look at the book of Acts. After Paul is in prison in Philippi with Silas, up until that time, Timothy has been with him. I mean, Luke has been with him. And why isn't Timothy in prison? Why isn't Luke in prison? After this, they probably left. They had work to do. Paul's in prison. But these fellow workers, after that, Luke doesn't use we. He just kind of talks Paul in the third person. He doesn't, he's not with them on this occasion. And so we come to after his, his, his traveling and being out of prison, Philipp, Philippi, we, we find that it very well could be Luke, who was well respected among all the, a lot of the churches. And they are involved in saying, I want you to accompany them to uh, Jerusalem. And that's, of course, Luke will be, will be with him on that, on that trip. But Titus is also. So they're distinguished. Titus was there. I want you to complete this work. But the, the money's going to be coming. Titus and Paul said, I hope if you let me go, <laughs> I'll go with it. And they do, apparently, because he goes. And they, they take that money to Jerusalem. That, that was the mission they were on. And there was the, there was the understanding that indeed he could, be, he, he could be trusted. And he was very dependable. Because we see in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, why he was so valuable to the ministry of Paul. We see in verse 18, I exhorted Titus and sent the brother also with him which I think he's still talking about one might be Luke. Did Titus take advantage of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not at, in the same steps? Notice he hits his heart and he hits his deeds. He hits his heart and he deals with his actions. And we're one. He has that kind of like mindedness. mindedness. Timothy had that. That he could trust him to preach exactly what he taught in all the churches. You have to trust men, but those men have to earn that trust. And they do that through their lives. To have him inside and out dependable. Not corrupt. And apparently both of those men were pretty young. And you might think, Paul's young, he's, he considers himself an old man when he's in his middle 60s. He dies at 66, 67 years of age. And uh, he said, well, that's, that's not old. Well, how come Medicare was set for people to get it at 65? You think the government said, I just think that'd be a good retirement. No, you'd be dead by 65. They wouldn't have to pay you a dime. That's when men's, that kind of lived during that time. We're, we live longer, don't we? And we appreciate that. And, but there's the sense of, you, of age. These men were, were not that age. They may have been you know, pretty young, even in, especially in our way we look at things. But his character, it, it just glistens to the scriptures. That Paul said, I've got some men I can depend upon. Luke has the respect of all the churches. As we've already seen in 2 Timothy, only Luke is with me. And they were, they were responsible. They were, the character was such that the cause would not be hurt when Paul's not there. And he had confidence in that. He just wanted to hear things from there. That's the closest that they have. And this is the letter that is written. You got one he writes to Titus and one he writes to, to Timothy. And this one is the deed before that. And so let's, let's, Look at what we're looking. Second Timothy three twelve. Come, uh, up, you know he wanted to meet him in Nicopolis, and we we said, well, where where in the world is the Nicopolis? Uh, Nicopolis, and we have here. Here's Caia and Corinth, you know, on the isthmus and so forth. But here you, he'll be, he comes from Rome. He goes to to Crete, leaves him there, and some say, well, that's where he wrote this letter. It very well could be or near there. Some thought, well, he he wrote it when he's uh, up. Opened Macedonia, that would be nearby, 
Uh, he, he, was, well, he was planning to meet Titus, Titus there, but this will be after the writing of, of 1 Timothy. And apparently he's, he's, uh, he was out of prison and uh, then he's going to be taken into prison where he's not going to be uh, re redeemed from the grave, uh, from, from the sword. He, he knew it was going to happen. So it's about 65, 66 A.D. when he writes this. Paul's dead at least by 68. Excuse me? What now? Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. All right, look at this theme for just a moment. I want to hit on, on this with, with sound doctrine. And we, a lot of people, I don't want to hear doctrine. Why? It's divisive. Okay, so what? We, we, want, we, we want the truth. So we, we don't want just any teaching. What is, what's the adjective? It's the sound teaching in it. And that word just simply means healthy. So the purpose of this, and it, in, that, in that theme, he said, I want you to set things in order by create, by following sound doctrine. And that doctrine would be there and, and how we're going to determine who is qualified to be uh, elders and how we're going to be, be teaching and so forth. So he begins by setting forth this, this fact of, of the sound teaching that, that needs to be uh, there. And Titus is there to help that happen. To manifest godliness in a society that desperately needs goodly or godly examples. We've already hit the, 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 about the lying and their laziness and that, that sort of thing. But they need to, 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 the gospel to change your lives. That was a challenge that was, that was there, but it needed to be done. And, and so in Titus 1, we're not going to read all the verses, but in verse 16, they profess that they know God, but by their works they deny Him. How people are living denies the fact, I know God. Yeah, we know God. No, you don't. You're not living it. You're not living according to God. And unto every good work being a reprobate, undiscerning, and so forth. So there is a necessity of doctrine, sound doctrine, and it's the idea of the teaching and application of being a good example. Now, we'll hit this. This is why this is important. It must be sound or healthy. It must be known, meaning you convict them in their heart. It's the fact, oh, I've heard of that teaching. No, I, I know it. It's, it's there reproving, uh, reproving me. It hits me at my heart. Elders are supposed to be able to hold to the faithful word, which is according to the teaching, sound teaching, revealed by God, Paul's teaching, Titus is enforcing that, that you may be able to both to exhort in the sound doctrine and convict the gainsayers. How can you exhort someone if they don't know the direction you're wanting to encourage them to go? I just, I just come here to encourage. What direction? Why should I be encouraged? What's the basis of why I should be encouraged? Because I don't feel encouraged. What's the basis of that? Sound teaching will help you. But it's also to convict the gainsayers, the same gospel that raises our, our, our hope and grounds it in a firm foundation that raises our spirits also penetrates the heart, the mind. You know it. And there's no apology for it. There is no, I just don't think that's strong enough. I got to add something to it. No, that, that's the truth. And it will never change. And gainsayers, it convicts them. And those who are honest will change. Those who don't, we, we, we'll deal with them too. Must be practiced in word or in, and also in deed. Verse 1, but speak to things which befit the sound doctrine. And he speaks about all the age groups that he deals with. And then verse 10, but he says, not prolonging, the idea of, of slave stealing from their master, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. How do you adorn the doctrine of God? The word adorn doesn't mean you're just wearing it. Just put it on, and, and that's all we do. No, you're beautifying it. How does the doctrine of Christ get beautified and ugly you and me? Comparatively speaking, to that glorious, beautiful gospel. 
You live it. You live it. That's, that's what beautifies the doctrine. They see it. The gluttons see it when you are, have self-control. The lazy people see it because you work earnestly. The liars see it because when you could have gotten out of trouble, you told the truth. What makes you tick? You want to have a Bible study? I'll show you why. And you come back to that sound teaching. We'll have to stop there. We'll pick up. Uh, you, you have your introductory ally. We'll probably just pick up dealing with question number one in lesson one. Laura willing next week. Thank you.